right in. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us, for giving us life, but more importantly, for giving us your Son, so that we could know true life, which is you. We thank you that you revealed yourself to us, that you took the initiative to, to give us your word, to give us your Son, to enter our world, and bring us the message of life. Help us to center and structure and found our lives on that on that alone, for your glory. Amen. Amen. All right. To recap where we've been the last couple of weeks, we talked about, in the first week, we talked about how the gospel is central because the gospel is what gets us to God. And that the reason for that uh, what we see as being the gospel will be determined by what we see as being the biggest problem or need we have. Our need determines what we think the good news is. And secondly, we saw how God's law is given to us to show us our need for the gospel, not just not to justify or sanctify us. The gospel sanctifies and justifies us. The law does not. It shows us our need. And then last week we talked about how our motive for holiness or sanctification must be God's glory, not our own. Because if we try to use God as a tool to make us look better, to clean us up so we look better and can feel better about ourselves. He won't march in our parade. And we talked about how neither spiritual disciplines like, like Bible study nor physical disciplines like, like exercise or eating right can transform our heart, but that they can point us toward the gospel that transforms the heart and that they will flow from a transformed heart. And I wanted to um, give a bit of clarification about how that works, what it actually looks like to use the gospel to um, bring cleansing and holiness to our lives. So I'm just going to pick one quick example and then we will jump into talking about what it means for a church to be centered and found, find its uh, source of unity in the gospel. But to, to clarify, from last week about how the gospel sanctifies us. Let's say that you had a problem, you were, having, you were struggling with pride. I actually was struggling with pride yesterday, um, and I already had this in my notes to talk about. I was like, oh no, I've got to listen to my own sermon. But the, uh, um, flip over to Philippians chapter 2, verses, starting verse 3, and I'll just kind of show you how this would work. If you were wrestling with pride, how you could use this passage to preach the gospel to yourself and point you to the cross as the way for freedom from pride. So you can just kind of read along and I kind of show you what this would look like in talking to yourself. I mean, first you acknowledge your sinfulness. I mean, say, you know, I have been acting from selfishness and empty conceit. I, I haven't been with humility of mind regarding other people as more important than myself. And, and I've been looking out for my own personal interest instead of the interest of others. So that's kind of verses 3 and 4 there. You, so you first acknowledge your sin, and then and then instead of resorting to your own willpower to change yourself, you go on to looking at how Jesus lived where you failed. So you would think, you know, Jesus, I praise you because you didn't cling to your rights. You humbled yourself. Uh, you didn't hold on to equality with God, but emptied yourself. You took the form of a bondservant. You are made in the likeness of men just like me. And so, so praising Jesus for his vicarious life in your place, and then his vicarious death next. But Jesus, you didn't even shrink back from humbling yourself to the point of death. Even death for people who are prideful and, and uh, selfish like I am. You took what I deserve. And then his vicarious resurrection. Jesus, you conquered death. God highly exalted you and bestowed on you the name which is above every name. You conquered death so I can live. And now you're at the right hand, Father, making intercession for me and for my sinfulness. And you, kind of dropping down to verses 12 and 13. What chapter are you in? Uh, Philippians chapter 2. 
Philippians chapter 2, and I'm down to verses 12 and 13. And you gave me your spirit, Jesus, to work in me, to, to give me the desire and the power to do your will, to, to uh, accomplish your good pleasure. So, so that's just kind of a rough outline of what it might look like to, to preach the gospel to yourself with the specific problem of pride. But I hope you can kind of see the general idea. You acknowledge your sin, but instead of resorting to willpower to conquer your sin, you're turning to Jesus. You're worshiping him for his perfect life his death in your place, for his resurrection, and thanking him for the gift of the spirit that changes us from the inside out. And when we do it that way, which is my problem, Yeah, we yeah. got tangled up with a multiple sclerosis people. It's like 17 million bites on them. <laughs> yeah, we came the other way, so we missed that. Um, so when we use the gospel that way, it kills sin by cutting off its head and using it as fuel for worship instead of our sin for sending us back to, it, see, it, hopefully you can see how much stronger that is than just um, when you when you sense pride, just saying, oh, i got to be humble, i got to be humble. Instead of, you use that sin of pride to cause you to worship God, Jesus even more because of the way he was humble, the way he um, died for your pride. And so hopefully that makes sense and brings a little more clarity to what I was trying to say last week. And the same principle, the same way of preaching the gospel to yourself, you can use that in encouraging other believers as well. When they're struggling with the sin, instead of just giving them the law, you know, okay, well, you got a problem with pride, fix it, you know. Um, you you can give them the gospel and encourage them that way. Give them something that'll really fuel change. Okay, this week, gospel-centered church unity. My first question for you is: Can unsaved people unite? Let's look in Genesis chapter 11 for an example in the Bible, and then we'll talk about some more some modern examples. Genesis chapter 11, verse 13. We'll read verses 1 through 9. It's not in this passage, but you should know that God had given people command to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And they were not just to clump in one area, but they were to spread out in the earth and take dominion over nature. Now this is uh, Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 to 9. Now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. And it came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone, and they used tar for mortar. They said, Come, let us build for ourselves a city, and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. And let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. The Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they all have the same language. And this is what they began to do, and now nothing will which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down, and there confuse their language, so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. <coughs> So we see something of a progression there in the desires and intentions of the people of Babel. In verse 3, what was the first thing they wanted to do? Looking at verse 3, what was the first thing that the group of people decided to do? To make the bricks? Mm -hmm. Yeah, making bricks. Because apparently there wasn't a lot of stone in that area, so they decided. So, is there anything wrong with making bricks? No. Okay. All right. Good. Just want to make sure you're with me. So then, what happens in verse four? What, then, what do they decide to do? They decide to do three things in verse four. Build a city. Tower. A tower. Okay. What's the last thing? Want? Make a name for ourselves. Make a name. Yes. Okay. So why did they pick these three things to do? What was their purpose in doing that? Kind of. To 
be like God or to be to reach towards heaven and be like God. Mm -hmm. I think that's what you're asking. Okay. Okay. So why like why do people normally want to live in a city versus living in a more rural area? You know, why do people live in Phoenix instead of in Cottonwood? Yeah. More to do. <laughs> yeah, we don't know. We don't live there. It's 46 years of that stuff. Yeah. I think I think we understand basically what it amounts to is that when you have a high density of people, it's easier to accomplish things more economically, more conveniently, more efficiently. What was the purpose for the tower? Why would they want a tower? Trying to get close to God, mm -hmm. or, or at least closer physically. Mm -hmm. yeah. At least show that they they can reach God with their own by their own might. Yeah, by their own might, exactly. Mm -hmm. And then, why did they want a name? The it, it kind of gives us a clue there. Why they wanted to do that? Well, I think they wanted to be called one certain people, or they wanted to be a collective group called one people. Mm -hmm. Why did it's a, it gives right at the end of verse four a reason why they were why they scattered. Yeah, why didn't they want to be scattered? What's that? It's harder when you're going out on your own mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they didn't want to obey God maybe yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They wanted to think for themselves so they got their <laughs> so I, we can kind of boil down maybe the reasons for their here. the reason for the city maybe was accomplishment easier to accomplish things when everything is close at hand and you work together maybe the reason for the tower was for glory for pride what we've done would be very visible. You could see it from anywhere in the in the surrounding area, and you could you could say, "Hey, you know, we're we're putting ourselves up there with God." And then maybe the name gave them the kind of a, a, a group identity that made them feel more significant, or like they had more purpose by um, having a group uh, identity that kept them t united. So throughout scripture, beginning here, we see <coughs> constant struggle and tension between men trying to create unity for their own glory and God creating unity for his glory. I think it's, it's, it's kind of classic here. What do you see similar between what God says in verse 7 and what they say in verse 4? It's, it's kind of humorous in a way. Actually, you see them saying it in verse 3 also. They say something in verse 3, kind of a common phrase there. Verse 3 and 4, and then, G, then, then my God says it again in verse 7. Do you see what I did? Come let us. Yes, exactly. Very good. Thank you. So they're, they're kind of, hey, come on, let's make some bricks. And they're, come on, you know, let's make a city and a name and a tower. And here's God saying, okay, come let us with a capital U there. I'm going to go down and confuse their language and show them which us is more uh, in charge. <coughs> it's interesting. It's one of the places. Uh, in the Old Testament where you see a hint of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. the, the Trinity doesn't come out in full view until the New Testament, but this is a place where we see it. And we see, it's a reminder to us that unity is actually rooted in God's Trinitarian nature. Um, that Trinity is a perfect example of unity. And in a way, God's purpose for bringing us uh, into unity is to be a mirror or a reflection or an image of his perfect unity. We see... Uh, that throughout scripture, like even in John 17, Jesus praying that they may be one, that the church may be one even as we are one. And so the church being a reflection of Trinitarian unity. Okay, so what do unsaved people unite over? What do they form societies or groups or clubs or unions over? For, maybe for, for their own glory. Yeah, I mean, just give me some specific examples, though. You're jumping ahead and giving me the why. I'm just asking the what. Give me some for things that they're united and things they have in common. Give me, like, give me some specific examples. What are some work? Right. Okay. Okay. Your job. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Right 
music. Mm -hmm. okay. And the bicyclist. Yeah, okay. The the recreation. <laughs> sports. Okay. Yeah, sports is a politics. Yeah. Uh -huh. Even unsafe people will unite over religion. Mm -hmm. Where would be an example of that in the world today? Pick one. Catholic Church. Okay, like in Ireland, Northern Ireland, maybe. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, what else? We're surrounded by education. Yes, yeah, okay, education. And the, the environment. Mm -hmm. as a group or a club or a society or an organization for just about anything you, know, you can imagine. Now, as an unsaved person, you know, not all not all groups, even of unsaved people are bad, but what is their reason for for uh, working together? What is their reason for coming together to work on these kind of projects or groups or whatever? Display that position. Persuade others to join them mm -hmm. to their okay. cause is right. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Self improvement. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking AA. Good, okay. okay. Another great AA. Okay. I think they, they accomplish a, a fellowship within their common cause. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the main thing is building a relationship because they don't like to be alone. So they gather around that common cause in order to accomplish the relationship needs. Mm -hmm. It's very good because what you find that de depending on the group more or less, but you find there's a there's an initial purpose, something they want to accomplish, accomplishment there. But then as time goes on, depending on the group, sometimes the, the fellowship, the, the group identity becomes begins to take on more of a weight and importance of its own than the original purpose even did. You can think of things like you know um, Masons or mm -hmm. some of those kind of groups, fraternal organizations, or even you know like. The Red Hat, I think they don't even have a purpose other than <laughs> fellowship or whatever. Yeah. And, uh, uh, so it's interesting how it starts out maybe with maybe with a purpose to actually accomplish something that would be hard to do as individuals, but then the, the need or the desire for glory or for identity begins to take on a weight and there is a kind of becomes a justification by click. Instead of finding their identity and their source in God, they, when they cut themselves off from obeying God and they just say, you know, I don't like God in my life, they wind up trying to, to feel good about themselves some other way and trying to find a, a group that looks cool to be a part of to, so they can kind of feel good about themselves. Okay. Next, what... That's what we were talking about unsaved people there. But what are some things that churches unite and divide over? And, and this can be things that they unite and divide over appropriately or inappropriately. Just, just um, one, any Not kind. Of, okay, give me some examples, specific. Uh, well, okay, what well, election? Okay. okay. Uh, Calvinism. Calvinism, Arminianism. Okay. What else? Social issues. Like, okay. Like abortion or okay. capital punishment. Yeah. Okay. Abortion, homosexuality, what else? Clothes and music. Good, 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 very good. Clothes and music. <coughs> Style of worship. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Style of worship. Most people associate worship with music. Mm -hmm. Legalism versus freedom. Uh, or mm -hmm. liberty. Liberty. See, that kind of that kind of fits into clothes music and a number of issues actually. Keep going. Okay, what are some other things that churches unite uh, and divide over? Trinity, modalism. Good, okay, good, okay. Trinity, yeah, of course. Baptism? Mission. Yeah, mode of baptism. Mission. Um, missions. Mm -hmm. What would be an example of a mission? Cooperatively, 
Oh, okay. Versus uh, individually. Okay. Yeah, that's true. There, there are all kinds of missiological strategies and arguments to that. Okay. Interesting. The deity of Christ. Mm -hmm. Okay. Color carpet for the sanctuary. <laughs> <laughs> carpet color, okay. I, I've seen a lot of bad things in churches, but thankfully I have not actually seen that. Unless you've been there, you wouldn't have Yeah, yeah, we wouldn't have Elders. Okay, yeah. Dividing points for churches might be the Bible as the only source. King James all my entire The uh, authority of Bible or inspiration of Bible. Mm -hmm. <coughs> wow. A lot of issues to fight over. Okay. Let's see. So some other dividing things might be ethnicity. Laity and the clergy in a relationship. Okay. Okay. And let's see here. Maybe creationism might be another issue. Sometimes churches might also <coughs> divide over of age and you know like try to try to attract certain people from a certain age range or something. Let's see. Yeah, okay, so we got a number of great examples there. The uh, there are two dangers that we face when we center on something like this. The first, of course, is that we can center on something besides the gospel. The, the danger isn't that the church, that it's impossible for a church to unite over something besides the gospel. It, it is possible for the church to unite over something besides the gospel. So it's not, it's not like the choice is between unity over the gospel or just being chaos. The, the danger is that you can, you can unite successfully, but unite over something other than the gospel. And like we talked about in the first week, how what you perceive to be the big problem that needs solving, that will determine what you see as being the big answer, the, the good news, the gospel. <coughs> um, in the same way, when, we see, when our perception of what the church really needs, the ultimate need of the church, that will determine what our church centers on and determine the gospel for our church. So our choices reveal our center. Now, I'll try to give you an example just from my own life, how this kind of plays out in, in, in uh, choosing a church and in, in uh, seeking to be centered on the gospel. I have I'm sorry, let me interrupt you. Just a couple of questions. Yeah, please do. The two dangers we face when we center on those issues? 
there is two dangers on, on any issue, actually. On any issue. Yeah, and I'm only giving you the first danger so far. The first danger. Okay. Thanks for, thanks for clarifying. The first danger, I'll go ahead and give you the second one, and we'll come back and hit it in more detail. Um, but the first danger is that we can center on something besides the gospel. The second danger um, that we'll cover in a minute is that we can love our unity more than we love God. Mm. And. But um, to go back to the first one, the, the first danger is that we would center on something besides the gospel. Did you have other questions? No, those are my two. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. I don't want to lose you here. The, uh, I have, um, there are a couple of issues that Jim and I and, and Randy and I disagree on, and I want to kind of just use those as an illustration of how we were able to work past those issues and center on the gospel instead of allowing the issues that we disagree on to separate us. And hopefully it'll clarify what I mean by being a gospel-centered, by, by, by centering on the gospel and finding our source of unity there. Um, the issues, I'm just going to write these up here, that we disagree on are the gifts of the Spirit, and music. So let's see here. That's that. I'm not going to go into a big description of the pros and cons of these. I just want to give you the, the names and show you how this plays out. Conservative and contemporary for music. Oh, that's cliche. Yeah, they're cliche. So. I think you know what I mean. I, both, uh, I, yeah. I know what you mean, but I don't know if everybody else knows. Okay. Do you, does everybody, anybody not know what I mean by did you Did you say she? What, what was the oh, cliche? You said cliche. Those, okay. those are both cliche. Or stereotypes. Cliche. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Better. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. He knows what it is. I don't know. The continuation is that these that the gifts of the spirit continue to be. Uh, although, just to clarify, so I don't freak you guys out too bad. Ninety-seven percent of what people that call themselves Pentecostals do is freaks me out just as bad as it does you. So, anyways, um, the. Uh, so why was it that these issues did not create a insurmountable uh, barrier for me to be able to be a part of this church and to be even an elder here? It's because both Jim and I see the gospel as being more important. Um, it's not that we don't think these issues are important and we hold our beliefs passionately but we see the gospel as being more important and more fundamental for our unity. To give you an example of how this would kind of play out, if, if you know, we're kind of fortunate here in the U.S. to have so many different flavors of churches to choose from, but if we were in most of the rest of the world, we'd have to make some tougher choices because there are far fewer Christians in general, and the church, the church situation is, as bad as it is here, is actually a lot worse just about everywhere else in the world. And so... Like, for example, if I was faced with living in a community where the only choices were PCA or Church of Christ, the PCA um, believes in infant baptism, and Church of Christ, traditionally anyways, most of them believe in baptismal regeneration. In other words, you have to be baptized to be saved. Hmm. So if I was faced with a difficult choice like that, I would probably go with the PCA church because PCA, this is a conservative um, branch of the Presbyterian church that actually teaches the gospel still. They're pretty solid on the gospel. So I would overlook the, the infant baptism issue as best as I could. And that would probably be the one where I would wind up going. And that would make it a little bit more complicated. If I was faced with a choice between Calvary Chapel 
and <coughs> PCUSA. And Calvary Chapel has, has music that that I think is inappropriate that they use in their worship services, but the PCUSA is a very liberal Presbyterian denomination that doesn't teach the gospel and endorses homosexuality and a bunch of other things. So, so in that case, I would wind up going to Calvary Chapel. Okay. Now, if it was a choice between, let's say, a mega church, just your typical you know, mega church with the the band on stage and the um, twenty minute feel good sermon with some platitudes and and wise advice and <coughs> and uh, <coughs> but not really preaching the gospel or an RPCNA, which is a very extremely conservative Presbyterian denomination that's they, the only thing they sing is psalms and they don't even use instruments <laughs> which is way more con conservative than I am even on music I would probably end up going here because they, the RPCNA is very conservative with their gospel they preach expositionally yeah go ahead uh, since this is all hypothetical how about United Methodist versus Seventh Day Adventist ooh <laughs> let's see okay <laughs> Neither. <laughs> <laughs> kind of goes to Amen. Amen. my next step. Because neither one preaches the gospel. Yeah, that's right. See, I was gonna. The example I was gonna give was uh, Mormon or Catholic. Yeah. In that, in that case, thing. yeah. In, in that case, the choice is not the lesser of two evils. Yeah. There is a. There is a. Uh, read your Bible on your own somewhere. Yeah. The, the choice there is either plant a church or move. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, or drive really far. So there, there. It's not. Uh, Situational ethics thing where you decide which you know which person you're going to throw off the boat so you don't drown or that kind of thing where you have to kill, you have to sin in order to not commit a bigger sin. Go ahead. You know you're touching on an area that sounds like uh, separation. At what point do we separate from a doctrine, and and what are the necessary elements that need to be there before we decide we will separate? Because, like Catholic or Mormon, you would separate. Mm -hmm. And some of these churches you've listed here uh, may or may not have separatable uh, offenses or grievances that you would find. So, this sounds to me like you're talking about separation. At what point mm -hmm. is there so much of a disagreement mm -hmm. that we can't really have fellowship or be in the church together? Mm -hmm. And you guys have not found that, that level. You all disagree on some issues, but they're not separatable issues. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, that's what it sounds like you're showing us here. Mm -hmm. okay. So the uh, is, it, is that clear to everybody what I was trying to say? Mm -hmm. Maybe that might be. I don't mean you're trying to be this way, Mark, but that might be a negative way to mm -hmm. to describe it, whereas the positive way might be. How uh, we unite on the gospel? That's what you're saying. Separation from is kind of the, the flip side of the coin. Yeah. It's um, because. <clears throat> Maybe that's a better way to say it. The other side. The idea of unity actually presupposes that there's a line, that there's something that you're uniting around, and that mm -hmm. there's a, a line, that, that there are some people that you can't be united with. So the two kind of go together. I like the way that Jim put it because. You know, rather than focusing on these negative aspects, if you just focus on the positive aspects, and I think that's where you'll probably end up. So thank you, Jim. I appreciate that. Thank you. How about the way it's facilitated in Philadelphia instead of a doctrinal issue? I don't know what I mean by that. Is there churches now that stress that the family needs to worship together at the Reverend Avis College or something? Family integrated. Well, I think family integrated church, but their doctrine's pretty good. I mean, it's pretty much right on. But they facilitated, they look up to, we don't want to do the Sunday school thing. We don't have an industrial revolution taking all of our kids away now. So they said the family should worship together like they did in the Acts Church or whatever. Mm -hmm. How about that? The decision you would make there. It would depend what the other choices were as far as churches. My, my issue with the family integrated movement is, it, there, actually, there's a lot of agreements that I have with them, but 
my my concern about the family integrated movement is it winds up becoming the family the family integration winds up becoming the center and rather than the gospel. Mm -hmm. And so they they kind of goes on to my next point that they kind of love unity in this case family unity more than they love uh, God and becomes some can become something of an idol to them where they become family centered rather than gospel centered um, to the point of to the point of you know your kids can yeah. your kids can be around people of any age except for kids of their own age it <laughs> winds up becoming kind of um, kind of crazy but well, the, it's not gospel centered. It, it, I mean, it, it can be gospel-centered, but it, there's a danger when you have any kind of thing that's important like that, that it becomes too important. Yeah. Well, the comparison will be Calvary to family integrated because Calvary specifically tells you to remove your children. Yeah, if it was a choice between Calvary and family integrated, I probably would go with the family integrated. Personally, that's, that's where I'm at with it. Um, yeah, I think so, because... Any questions? Tough stuff. Yeah, it is tough stuff, and these are these are unpleasant choices to have to deal with. And thankfully, like I said, thankfully here we don't have hard choices this hard. But there are many of our brothers and sisters around the world that face choices a lot harder than this. Mm -hmm. And um, it takes great wisdom and discernment from the Lord to know where the boundary line is. But uh, maybe this is a good point. Does everybody understand? When you defined it, when you gave those terms, continuationism, cessationism, conservative, contemporary. How oh, they would play out in these? No, no, no. The, do people, and I'm asking, actually asking everyone that, do, people, do you guys know what that means? Well, that's through talking about the spirit, the continuism. Are the works of the spirit still functioning? Mm -hmm. And obviously, conservative and contemporary is a class that music would be. That's what I understood it means. Yeah, my, my point in bringing him up wasn't to to go into a defense of my positions on the military, but just to show you. So in these, in all of these cases, I would wind up having to give up some of my some of my beliefs on these issues in order to pick the church that's the most uh, gospel. So in the, if, assuming that Jim picked the same way that I would, he would have to give up some of his to be in either one of these two. So it's a uh, um, those are tough choices, and you wind up having to pick which issues are really most important to you as you, as you face. Uh, and, and these things, the, these doctrines up here, the continuation, is there dynamics? Because you have John Piper, who was pretty much cessationism at one time, and now he's leaning a little bit more towards continuationism. No, he, he's always been a continuationist. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He, yeah he's, he has been for, for quite a while. Well, he's displaying it more now in the pr public way um, with, uh, what was her name? Beth Moore? What? Beth Moore? Yeah, on stage with Beth Moore waiting for God to talk. Yeah, that, mm -hmm. anyways, that was kind of, mm -hmm. that was, I heard the recording of it, <coughs> that too, that was interesting. Um, let's see. Okay, um, but talking about the family integrated thing, and kind of leads me into the next thing I was, the, the second danger that I told you about, the, the danger is that we can love our unity. Even what starts out as gospel-centered unity, there's a danger that we can love that more than we love God. When we love our group, um, our, our group accomplishment, or our group glory, or our group, group identity, these things here, more than God, we will, like Babel, invite God's judgment on our group. We think of this as being here's where God is, and here's here. here's let's say that's Jim, and here's me over here. Okay. If we our goal becomes just getting united, Jim and I getting united to go like this, we can maybe achieve unity, but it's taking us it's keeping us away from God. Whereas if we instead just focus on getting as close to God as we can, we'll wind up becoming naturally and spontaneously united to each other as well. Um, mm -hmm. So, that, But if we, we do this, we instead just focus on man-centered unity, then God winds up often, as he did at Babel, creating division of some kind or another between us. Because God doesn't 
particularly um, approve of our man-centered forms of unity. And so we have to love God more than we love other people, love God more than we love unity with other people, and following Jesus means that you will always have, at least this side of heaven, you will always have a, a degree of loneliness in your walk with God. Be, there's always a sense in which it's just you and Jesus, and there are certain places in your life that you will always be a little lonely. Um, as much as, much as I agree with Jim on so many issues, there are a number of issues that we agree on, and but there are certain issues that I don't, and that it's, it'll probably be that way until we get to heaven, and that's okay. And there are some of my, you know, my favorite preachers, you know, like John Piper and Paul Washer, people like even even great people like that. There are issues that I disagree with them on, and I think God allows that to happen rather than giving us anybody that we totally agree with every, about everything on. Because if we found somebody that we agreed with on everything, I think they would become kind of an idol to us, and that relationship would become too important. And so, God leaves people in our lives that we disagree with to cause us to hunger for him and recognize that he alone must be our source and our chief love. So if, if, if that, there's like, okay, this is how we focus on the gospel so that we have unity there and we proceed along. But meanwhile, these issues are unresolved. That doesn't mean to say that, well, we do know that there is error there because not everybody's got it right. So you can't have a relativistic, be relative about Oh, it's all right because it's okay with God. It's all good. People right. say no, no, because it isn't. Because somebody has just got it wrong. Okay. So you have okay. Let's proceed on. Let's be unified and, and be grow the church. You know, uh, grow in our walk and our sanctification. Meanwhile, we're still studying these issues because we need to have it resolved at some point. And not be satisfied. It's okay to disagree because we need to come to reconciliation at some point because somebody's got it wrong mm-hmm. and be concerned about that. Is that it's not correct? What do you think? No, I, I agree with you. You, you okay. don't not you don't avoid the issues right. because you don't you can't necessarily agree on which one's right. You still yeah. have to study the issues. Yes. You still have to address the issues. Mm-hmm. But you don't address it in a in a divisive way. You dress it address it in a united way and Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, the the the, the supposition or presupposition that there's absolute truth would would lead you to believe that there has to be error. Mm-hmm. So you can, I mean, nobody's, <laughs> I mean, this right here is truth, absolute truth. Mm-hmm. But I know that me and in myself and my flesh, even interpreting this, I'm subject to error. Mm-hmm. Yes, Steve. Yeah, I think the pick the upside, that we have to be real careful though, to realize we don't have perfect knowledge. And all of the groups that are there, and I'm following what Sam, they would all say they can find their their you know their positions in scripture. So I'd be careful that you know we would be prideful to say that we could come to a perfect understanding until we're in heaven, we're perfectly known, we perfectly know God. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, from, from my standpoint, you know, in terms of worship and fellowship in, in, in church, and worship fellowship, that that type of uh, worship and fellowship, I would look to the person of Jesus, the work of uh, uh, the way of salvation. And then um, uh, probably the authority of Scripture; those would be my three non-negotiables. And then beyond that, I would take John 17, where Jesus prays that His disciples would be one—not that they would be the same, but there would be one. There'd be a unity within the diversity. And that uh, I would, if I was going to err, I'd try to err on the side of fellowship, always maintaining those three non-negotiables that I can work together with you for a common cause, such as the administration with the, with the Catholic Church in particular going to try to impose upon them to do things that are against their conscience. Um, so we are, the Southern Baptists are going to work with the Catholics in order to oppose that and maintain religious liberty. So we can work together, but we don't worship and necessarily fellowship because of the disagreement over the person of Jesus, the way of salvation, and the authority of Scripture. Yeah, I see what you're saying there. And in the case of, I, I, there's, there's room for working as individuals with people of other religions and that's on, on all kinds of issues and political issues. Um, certainly, but the, the the danger that I see in certain things, certain kind of ecumenical, um, political things, um, can be like the Manhattan Declaration is an example of this. Um, can be giving people the idea that we think that they're not just in agreement with us on this issue, but that we think that they're 
um, that in the case of the Catholics, that their religion is actually a Christian religion. Um, so that so we have to. It, it's a tough. It's a tough. How do we how do we unite with them in a way that we can work together on the issue without giving the public the idea that we agree that their understanding of the way of salvation is a pretty fine line. It's tough. Yeah. <coughs> I did it again. Five pages of notes and twelve minutes to go. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Quit, so. Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to kind of read some of this and not elaborate at all. And then, let's see. Okay, so unity, true gospel-centered unity, is a gift of God, centered on God, and coming to us through the cross. Unity is a secondary effect of conversion based on, first, a shared experience, the experience of being converted, changed, giving a, being given a new heart. Our shared experience we have is more powerful than any other shared experience that people of the world may have, even, even going to war together. Being converted is a more powerful experience than that. Secondly, we have a unity based on shared goals that are more important than any of the world's goals. Goals of worshiping God, holding each other accountable and discipling each other, and spreading the gospel um, in our community and around the world. Third, our unity is based on a shared lifestyle of slavery to Jesus, a lifestyle that is more costly than any of the world's lifestyles. <coughs> Our unity, fourth, is based on shared beliefs that are more vital and fundamental and real than any of the beliefs that the world holds to. And lastly, the unity we have is based on being actually a part of one body, a unity that the world doesn't have anything even like. Um, where we actually have the same head, Christ Jesus, and the same spirit within us. God's purpose for this gift of unity is to smash the world's barriers of ethnicity or age or whatever, when God can bring together Jews or Greeks or Arabs and Jews today, uh, or, or teenagers and elderly people or black and white people, it demonstrates to the world that the gospel of Jesus transcends all the artificial cliques of the world and exalts the surpassing value of Jesus. The, um, the judgment God passed on Babel was a division of the languages, and that division will be finally removed around the throne where people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation will worship the lamb that was slain for them. We see in Revelation the end of Babylon and the establishment of the new Jerusalem that will go on forever. And God gave us just a little preview of this at Pentecost when people from every from a number of different ethnicities and languages were all able to understand the message of the gospel being spoken. And so the church is meant to be now sort of a preview of heaven, as people see us imperfectly, but still striving to get, to get as close to God as we can. And in the process, a unity is created amongst us that displays to the world that the gospel is more powerful than the cliques of men. Lastly, to talk about why past gospel-centered movements have dwindled. It used to be in the early church be gospel-centered, they just called you a Christian. <laughs> and then that term got watered down, and so then you had to be called a Protestant to be known as gospel-centered. And then the term Protestant got watered down, and you had to be known as a fundamentalist to be gospel-centered. And then that term got watered down, and you had to be an evangelical. And now even evangelicalism has dwindled in effectiveness, and we have the latest movement of being gospel-centered that's seeking to reclaim that center. Um, I skipped that. I had planned to talk about what caused the decline of Pentecostalism and fundamentalism and evangelicalism, but basically what caused the decline even for all of these movements throughout <coughs> church history 
was that when the movement was small, it attracted people who were willing to suffer. But as it grew in size and power, it began attracting people looking for glory and identity for the tower and the name, and seeking to use that movement just to, to feel good about themselves, essentially. So as we look at the state of the Southern Baptist Convention today, I was um, surprised recently to, to learn that the Southern Baptist Convention does not actually have much of a center because you don't have to agree even to the Baptist faith and message to be a Southern Baptist church. You have to give your 400 bucks a year, um, be in friendly cooperation, whatever that is, and not endorse homosexuality. Um, you don't even have to, your church doesn't even have to enforce believer baptism to be a Southern Baptist. So it's just, it's kind of crazy. And it, so it, it um, is, I think, God's grace that the Southern Baptists have existed for 160 years without uh, wandering further from the gospel than they have. And they have, and they come back to some. So. Yeah, that was going to be my question, is has this been a steady progression of decline as far as some of the doctrines that they embrace? And Within the Southern Baptist, um, it's actually come back some. The Southern Baptist started very conservative in the 1800s, but then um, due to the influence of liberalism and things coming in in the early 1900s, it became more and more liberal until in the late 1970s, early 1980s, there was a, a big... Um, controversy and struggle within the Southern Baptist Convention, which ultimately the conservatives won in what's known now as the conservative resurgence, um, led by Adrian Rogers and a few other men like him who um, saved the denomination and changed the leadership of the seminary so that the pastors being pumped out today are much more conservative than they were 30 or 40 years ago. Praise God. Um, but it's still vulnerable because, as I said, there's no there's not actually a, a fixed center for the Southern Baptist Convention. It's um, it's left very um, vulnerable to whoever shows up and votes, actually. And um, there is hope for change as these conservative conservative young pastors grow older and um, take the leadership of the denomination. If the gospel-centered movement itself doesn't crash prematurely, the gospel-centered movement, best as I can tell, began in the the mid-1990s with the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals, um, which was started by James Henry Boyce and Michael Horton and David Wells, and came to uh, include a number of other uh, common and important figures today. Then in, the, uh, in 2006, Together for the Gospel um, was launched, and, it, uh, and then I think 2008 is when the Gospel Coalition Came along. Each of those groups has become successively um, wider in scope. The Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals is very conservative. Together for the Gospel is a little more inclusive, and the Gospel Coalition even more so. So as the Gospel Center movement has become increasingly wide, um, there are some dangers that are visible on, on the horizon. The first danger that I see would be that the love of Gospel-centered identity may cause compromise on underlying doctrines. We saw that last fall with the elephant room, or excuse me, earlier this year, with the elephant room and the fallout from that with uh, some, an issue as fundamental as the Trinity being um, waffled on by some members of the Gospel Coalition. And um, anyways, that was uh, one issue that was handled disappointingly. Um, and then other issues like um, creationism or even um, the eternality of hell are sometimes up for debate within gospel-centered uh, circles, which you could believe, you could be a Christian without believing in six-day creation, you could believe in, you could be a Christian even without believing in eternality of hell, I suppose, um, but when you throw those issues out, it does weaken your evangelism and <coughs> your understanding of the scripture's uh, authority, I would say. So, um, the Trinity, of course, is an absolutely fundamental issue. Um, the second danger I see would be the danger of inconsistency between belief and behavior, that even though we have the right doctrinal statement on paper and hold to it mentally, 
do we really believe that? Do we really trust it? And mm -hmm. has it really changed our lives? Mm -hmm. you know? Or is it just intellectual assent? And even um, it is easy to affirm the gospel on paper, but then use man-centered evangelism methods and techniques to try to attract followers. Um, the third danger that I see for the gospel center movement would be the loss of meaning through just using gospel lingo. Each, each uh, movement has its own set of lang language that, help, that seeks to correct and clarify the language of the preceding movement. Then over time, as people get used to the language, it just be, kind of becomes catchphrases and people lose the understanding of what those things actually mean. I think it was Paul Washer who, was, who said, um, when, you know, 10 minutes after Jesus returns, we will understand everything there is to understand about eschatology. Hmm. But 10 million years after he's returned, we will still not fully understand the gospel. We will still be delighting in new aspects mm -hmm. and glories of the gospel. And so when we reduce the gospel to a formula, there is a danger that we can think, now I understand the gospel, I've got that settled. And, and uh, reducing it to a formula can weaken the movement. So, in conclusion, uh, in, uh, at the conclusion of the Constitutional Convention in 1787, the story goes that a woman asked Franklin, Benjamin Franklin, so what kind of government have you given us? And he said, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. And I think the message for us is, God has given us the gospel, if we can keep it. Um, and we see, looking at church history, that the gospel is easily lost, that our hearts naturally cling to things other than the gospel. And so I'm going to just close with a challenge from Hebrews chapter 10. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider, let's think about this, let's ponder this, let's study this, how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day, is the day of Christ's return drawing near. So as we see the day of Christ's return drawing near, may that encourage us to hold to the gospel and to hold each other to the gospel because that is our only hope. Thank you all. Let us pray. Did you have a question? Okay. Jesus, we are such weak and sinful people. You've given us such great truths in your word, and you've given us yourself, and yet we are prone to wander, prone to leave the God we love. We pray that you will take our hearts and seal them, that you will keep us, and that you will help us to guard the gospel and to, to care for each other, that when we see each other wandering from the truth, that we will run after each other and Jesus, may the gospel be precious to us. Your perfect life in our place. Your death receiving the wrath we should have gotten. Your resurrection from the dead. Bringing us new life and giving us <coughs> your spirit to live in us. And produce your life in us. May these truths be the center and the foundation of everything we do as a church and as Christians. May you receive the glory. May you be our love and our joy and our chief treasure. Amen.